Hey folks, really happy to see you all out here for this uh, uh, today's um, seminar in the in the summer series. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce a vibrant uh, young colleague, uh, Dr. Beth Ailman. Uh, she's going to talk to us about early Mars, uh, a view from the rovers and orbiters. And uh, Beth holds currently a joint position um, as an assistant professor in, in the planetary sciences at Caltech, uh, while also serving as a research science uh, scientist at JPL. Um, so she's a bit busy lady, I'm sure. Um, she's a co-investigator on the CRISM imaging spectrometer uh, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and she was a student science collaborator on the Mars Exploration Rover, so that got her off to a great planetary geeky start right at the beginning. Uh, she's a participating scientist on the uh, MSL, Curiosity Rover, and an affiliate of the Dawn Science team for Ceres. Um, she's going to talk to us about Mars today, but I'm sure she'd love to take questions about Ceres as well uh, during the question and answering uh, uh, period. She earned her PhD in 2010 uh, in geology uh, at Brown University. And she received two Masters of Science degrees from the University of Oxford in geomorphology and environmental change and management. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Washington University in St. Louis. So with that, take it away, Beth. Okay, uh, let's see, the lavalier mic on? Okay, great. So thanks, it's a great pleasure to be here at Ames because actually some of my formative exper experiences as a student were here in the 2002 Ames Academy uh, program, then the Astrobiology Academy. So one of those that made a great impression on and, def and stayed in planetary science. So just so I have a sense of my audience, I I'm familiar with the diversity of Ames Research Center. How many folks here are geologists? Okay, there's a few. How about biologists? You can raise your hand twice. All right, all right, excellent. Roboticists of some form or another? Okay, aeronautics? Okay, any other form of earth and planetary science or the support thereof? <laughs> all right, fabulous, so everyone's raising their hand. Great, well, let's get started. So my, I was originally gonna talk uh, focusing on a historical perspective on early Mars, and that was sort of geology focused. So I decided to expand it a little bit and focus on instead um, the question of water on Mars through time. That, of course, is our critical resource for habitability. It's also a critical resource uh, for humans. And so we'll look to the past and also to the future. So I think everyone in the audience is very well familiar with the morphologic evidence of water on Mars, these amazing paleo channels. Here I've tilted the globe, so we're looking into the northern lowlands, and you can see them debauching there. Of course, there's no flowing water on the surface of Mars now to get everyone on the same page here. So Mars is about half the radius of Earth, it takes twice as long to orbit the sun, although other parameters like the axial tilt and the length of a day are about the same uh, as, as here on Earth. Now, of course, the critical parameters, some of them are the solar flux, which at 43% uh, that of Earth's uh, leads to quite a, much, a significantly colder average surface temperature. So this is just some data acquired from the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that show the typical uh, diurnal flux here, starting off the day around about 190 Kelvin uh, temperatures, and then heading up to a, a maximum that actually exceeds uh, the freezing point of water before growing down. So it's an immense temperature change uh, over just the course of a day, and that's a consequence of the, of the thin atmosphere. Um, it's a six millibar atmosphere and a basaltic surface. Okay, so this is Mars at present. Uh, how different was past Mars, the past Mars that created these channels? So now when we think of water on Mars, we actually could have a few visions of environment in our head as we think about this question. One is that past Mars was warm and wet. Uh, that is, globally over the entire surface, the temperature was greater uh, than zero degrees Celsius for the vast majority of the year an integrated hydrologic cycle. It, we know, we think we know, Mars lacked the vegetation you see in this uh, picture, but braided channels, rivers, streams, and warm temperatures in causing a uh, weathering and the creation of these soils. That is a possibility. Now, of course, another end member is that it's wet, but it's quite cold, and that the temperature is, in fact, less than zero. 
So this is a type of environment I uh, spend some time exploring. I think this is an apt analog. So I spend some time exploring it in, in Iceland, where the water is not felt fed by rainfall. It's fed, fed by melt of glaciers and ice caps and seasonal snows. Finally, there's also the possibility that Mars was always relatively cold and relatively dry, just wet Er, with, uh, for example, this is Don Juan Pond uh, in the Antarctic Dry Valleys, which seasonally uh, is wet. Okay, so there's sort of three axes that we can use in a historical sense to study Mars. Um, two are observational, mineralogy, chemistry, and geomorphology, and the third is modeling. So I'm going to be talking about the observational evidence in this presentation, uh, although you can ask me, those of you who do modeling, ask me questions, because uh, I'm up on that literature, but we only have about 45 minutes. Uh, so th let's think about the past. Now, let, to orient ourselves, it's worthwhile to think about, about some of the other past processes. So th this just summarizes some of the things that were going on on Mars and elsewhere in the solar system. So starting from the bottom, we know that Mars actually formed uh, relatively early. It didn't have this moon disrupting impact. And some of the isotopic folks who date think Mars formed uh, less than 20 million years uh, into the history of the solar system. Our geologic record starts that we're able to access so far with landing on the surface starts around 4.1 billion years ago with immense volcanism, which sort of tapers off through time, just so shown schematically. Of course, this is similar to the period where all of the largest impact basins uh, formed on Mars, those less than 500, uh, those greater than 500 kilometers or so. So we know that Mars was also being pummeled during its earliest uh, Nuwakian epoch. Uh, in time. We also know that Mars had a magnetic field, but then lost it very, very early, before the start of the Noachian, actually. And all the time that this was happening, our sun was actually getting brighter with, with time. That's a natural consequence of stellar evolution. So that's the backdrop. I'm going to be talking to you about these items, which will make this will make a lot more sense, hopefully, at the end, about the mineralogic record of water on Mars as seen through phyllosilicates, or clay minerals, and salts of various kinds, as well as the valleys and the outflow channels. And I'm going to propose a thesis um, based on the data of rovers and landers to date, as well as our orbital data, that um, the most persistent, longest-lived environment with liquid water has always been the Mars subsurface, the groundwaters, the hydrothermal systems, and that liquid water is actually relatively uncommon except for a brief period around the Noachian Hesperian boundary. It's only sort of there ephemerally ever since. So I'm going to show you some of the data. You can decide at the end whether you agree with this or not. But let's begin with the present. We're going to start here, and we're going to work our way backwards in time through uh, each of these Martian environments that I have time to get through in the course of this talk. So let's start modern. So anyone who reads the news has probably seen uh, these pictures, the recurring slope lineae uh, around, around Mars, right? And you've probably heard the back and forth about the hypotheses. So what is the evidence? Well, the evidence is that they start being active within about uh, 10 Kelvin or so of the um, freezing point of water. And then they're most active slightly thereafter. So it seems to be consistent with uh, at least the melting of, or the sublimation of ice triggering the process. Um, perchlorate salts have been detected in association with a few of them, although H2O itself has not been directly detected associated with them. Now, there are reasons for that. The orbiter that has the ability to detect it passes over at 3 PM. The best time to look for water is the early morning. So uh, that is an observational bias that we have to consider. And the sources of water for these features are not terribly well understood, because some of them occur on these mesas or buttes, where they're just right at the pinnacle. So, so where is the water coming from? It's, it's not clearly groundwater. The source has to be in some way atmospheric. So this has led to uh, proposals of deliquescing salts as one possibility, as subsurface ice deposits uh, for another. But how common can liquid water be on Mars? Well, I thought I'd pull out, since I'm at Ames, and Bob Haberly's at Ames, I thought I'd pull out this oldie but goodie plot from uh, 2001, where you can see here, um, so here is the, the uh, stability fields for water. And you can see that there actually is part of Mars that is above the, the triple point. So this means water is thermodynamically permitted. 
Of course, it's not stable as the atmosphere is undersaturated uh, relative to water, so it evaporates, such is, of course, also the case on Earth. Um, from the same uh, paper, there, uh, Bob plotted out uh, those places where there, are, and the number of days in the Martian year that, that the portion of the surface was above the triple point of water. This is not cumulative days, it means once in a day we cross over that threshold. And so 20 days out of the year, 16 days out of the year. Not great, not bad, not impossible that there's liquid water. So that's one context, RSLs and where we sit relative to the triple point in water stability. Now let's go to some of the data from the rovers. So this is uh, an image from the Curiosity landing site near the Rock Nest Sands, which are one of the materials that we sampled. And we found evidence of these perchlorate salts that have also been detected associated with these RSLs. So let me explain to you uh, the plot here. So perchlorates are present in the soil. Uh, the plot that you see here is relative humidity and temperature. And these are various days of the Martian year. And you can see these are some of the data from Curiosity for where, we're part, where um, the air temperature was in relative humidity, temperature, space. Now, using that data, we're plotting a different axis. Temperature is still the y-axis, but now the, the x-axis has been transformed to the activity of water, which is an indicator of whether, for example, salts would deliquesce. And so now those data are being superimposed on a phase diagram of ice as well as perchlorate hydrates. So perchlorate is a, um, like a magnesium Cl04 dot 8H2O dot 4H2O. And you can see that during sometimes we just nick the potential liquid area uh, of, of this phase diagram. When does that happen? Well, if we plot those data now as a function of season on Mars and as a function of the time of day on Mars, you can see that it's early uh, in the evening, extending up until midnight in, in some seasons in the, in the, in the autumn. And then the, the best period that if we were going to look for this or thought there might be water would be early in the morning. So this has actually been something that's affected the operations of the Curiosity rover. When I serve my role sometimes as chair of the science working group, I now have to certify that we don't see and we're not going to interfere with any, any liquid water features that might have formed from this process for which we as a rover aren't sterilized. So I have to certify that we meet planetary protection constraints. Although if we saw one, we would certainly from a distance stand off and, and, and monitor it. And indeed, there are some of these, um, some features that were proposed to be recurring slope linear on the mound of Gale Crater. You can uh, Google that and read, read more about it. Uh, so far, none of them are exhibiting all of the expected behaviors. So maybe the next lander will land near one. So another aspect of, since we're talking about salts in the soil, uh, we see these in trace amounts, as I was discussing at Gale. They're sort of at a 1% to 2% level in the soil. The Spirit rover, uh, several years earlier on the other side of the planet, found different kinds of hydrated salts, this time sulfates instead of perchlorate, and at significantly higher fractions, up to 30 to 40% of the bulk soils. And here I'm showing a NavCam uh, image where they were overturned by the rover wheels. So the chemistry of sulfate was established by analyses with the APXS that showed correlation of uh, sulfur with magnesium, and also there's likely a chloride, chloride component, which is either something like an NaCl or something like a, like a perchlorate. And um, that the fact that these exist in recent aeolian deposits only, you know, that far beneath the surface indicates that their formation has to have been relatively recent because these are aeolian deposits. They move around. They're, they're, uh, we know that on time scales of, of even that are observable from orbit, um, Mars does have sand mobility. So these are water-related salts deposited um, within the relatively recent, recent history. Of course, we have no direct way of knowing time right now, but it's sort of on the order of uh, thousands, tens of thousands of years is, is thought to be likely. Okay, so what, those are, that's the salt story and the sort of the modern, maybe right on the edge water story. What about, what about elsewhere? Well, let's keep stepping back. So, in the Amazonian period of Mars, which is actually this long period that goes from about 3. billion years ago to the present, 
It's thought that Mars has always been relatively dry during this period. I could give an entire talk on the interesting features of Amazonian Mars, but they mostly have to do with ice. So we heard already about the RSL. What I've talked less about is, and I will not touch on much in this talk, is the uh, large deposits of ground ice. So we know there's ice at the Martian poles. There's also substantial um, meters thick deposits, if not greater, uh, in the mid-latitudes and poleward of that. And we know this because we've observed it with gamma ray and neutron spectrometer data, and then directly by high-rise and chrism observations that, of impact craters that have excavated. And we think the reason that these large ice deposits exist, some of which are not currently stable against sublimation, are that Mars has a chaotic obliquity cycle. So Mars today has a tilt much like Earth, a seasonality uh, whose intensity is much like Earth, but this was not always so. Um, this plot, which is a little hard to see, but um, so the, the current obliquity right now is about, is about uh, 25 or so degrees. And you can see that though there are these substantial fluctuations. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing three million years of time and the actual axial tilt shifts from 15 to 35 degrees. Now, those of you who study Earth might know about Milankovitch cycles, right? So the tilt there, the is, it's like less than two degrees, far less. So, uh, and that's enough to send Earth into ice ages. So Mars, we know, has to undergo these profound changes on a time scale um, that we can't observe directly, but in a geological sense is quite recent. And this is just another illustration uh, of that. Again, the plot is a little bit difficult to see. Apologies for that. Um, Lascar's modeling shows that, in fact, um, the tilt can be up to 70 degrees if we go back long enough in history. The mode, uh, modal distribution over the last 500 million years or so is about from 10 uh, up to about 50 degrees obliquity. So these huge changes that change where ice is stable, where volatiles are stable, how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. One of uh, the discoveries of the last decade has also been the formation of gullies uh, in alcoves. Various uh, hypotheses have been proposed. One is snow, these sort of pasted on terrains with these channels feeding from them. So these gullies are located preferentially in the, in the sort of mid-latitudes of Mars, extending both directions. Now, there's been recent work showing a lot of the formation is due to CO2 uh, ice destabilization and landsliding, but not all of them. And this is an example of, of one of the exceptions um, this, in this paper by Schoen, which shows uh, the classic uh, gully alcove channel deposits. And then those of you in the front who are seat seated in the front of the room, if we switch over here, can see that there are several lobes of these alluvial fans that indicate different phases of activity to cross over and form these fan-shaped deposits. And you can see the small little channels uh, within those features. This can be age dated by um, crater counting from a cross-cutting ray of, of secondary craters from a nearby impact. And it's quite recent. It's only a million years old. So we think that there is ephemeral liquid water um, on the surface of Mars today at certain times, at certain places. and. Uh, it's there to explore. But let's keep working backward. So we already took a look at our outflow channels. These outflow channels were active right around the Hesperian Amazonian boundary um, in sort of punctuated periods of catastrophic release, at least uh, half a dozen episodes, as Ken Tanaka has revealed. But now, uh, and then the other, sorry, and then the other thing heading uh, happening during this same time period of sort of the Hesperian Amazonian are the presence of uh, the volcanic fumaroles. So one of the more interesting deposits uh, that has been identified is located in Nili Patera. So this is an, a ginormous shield. It's within the ginormous shield volcano Certus Major, which is comparable in size to something like the Deccan Traps uh, deposits uh, on Earth. Uh, the image I'm showing here, this, uh, th this is the entire rip, this is a portion of the Nili Patera volcanic crater. Uh, the small cone that you see here is about five kilometers across, and then there's the, these lava deposits uh, that head from it. There are also, however, silica deposits uh, associated around it. And those of you who have been to volcanoes know that another feature of volcanoes is often hot springs in the vicinity if there's sufficient water that's heated up. 
So uh, J.R. Skoke taking a close look uh, at the uh, cone within Nilipatera caldera identified these tiny patches here that are enriched in silica. So that's SiO2.H2O. And silica is a feature that forms um, in many sorts of volcanic environments. And which one exactly this is is sort of perhaps important for its astrobiological implications. One is sort of the classic Yellowstone style hot spring where you have hot waters upwelling leading to formation of sinter deposits. Um, in a precipitation of silica from uh, silica-enriched waters. Another is like what we see around Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, where sulfurous gases lead to leaching of volcanic deposits and deposition of silica around them. Both environments on Earth are colonized by microbial life, and I think uh, they would be fabulous. Now, we've had the benefit of exploring another potential analog. Uh, and I say potential because it's actually much debated how similar are these or not. There's no gigantic crater in Gusev, uh, excuse me, there's no gigantic volcano within Gusev Crater where the Spirit rover landed. And yet there is a large silica deposit in what has been inferred to be um, a volcanoclastic deposit source of volcanism, not precisely sure, but the entire floor of Gusev Crater is filled with lavas. So we do know that at some point in history, um, after the crater formed, uh, Gusev did have a period of volcanic infilling. So uh, the Spirit Rover spent a great deal of time here, uh, over, over, I think it was three years, and one of the major discoveries in exploring home plate, you can see the edges of that circular feature here, is that in some of the rocks exposed on the edges, and this is one collection of these sort of rubbly uh, deposits, you see these spectacular digitate structures where um, pieces of different clasts, and you can see some dark colored clasts within, have been cemented together and that portions of the rock are highly enriched in silica, like 98% silica with um, only a little bit of titanium oxide as the other associated feature. And so, an analog that has been proposed, both the Yellowstone analog and the silica sulfate uh, acid fog scenario have been proposed, and this is a hot area of research right now with this kind of picture being the original scenario, but the, the Yellowstone type view um, is, is also being proposed. So those of you who are eager to work on a project, there's definitely room to contribute on this question. Relevant to, for example, where one might send rovers to look for life or what kind of ancient environments existed on Mars. Okay, so everything I've talked about so far in my first approximately uh, 20 minutes of talking here was from about 3.3 billion years forward, right? So these ephemeral, potentially modern water yet today, um, our silica deposits, these immense outflow channels. Now we get into a period that is just fundamentally different. So around 3.5, 3.3, somewhere in there, uh, age dating is hard when you're limited to crater counting. There was a, a profound change, um, and in this early period that I'm about to talk about now, um, the relative timing of things is not so established. We see geographically widespread and diverse environments with liquid water. And this picture of the mineralogy of the surface, um, even if you're not a mineralogist, hopefully points a finger to, at some of the diversity. So uh, what is this picture? So this is a, a map of, of Mars, just a hillshade map of Mars. So you can see the large topographic features of the volcano. Everywhere that the terrain uh, looks relatively smooth to you is a younger part of the surface, uh, an, an Amazonian, sometimes Hesperian surface. Everywhere the terrain looks a bit mottled, it's because it's heavily impact cratered. And so you can see immediately there's an association uh, that the older, uh, materials, the, this, these mineral records of water are, record, are really only in the um, oldest trains with a few exceptions. And if we were to zoom in on each of these locations, we'd see that they're associated with an impact crater that either created a hydrothermal system or simply excavated uh, buried material from depth. So um, aqueous minerals are in the oldest trains. The other thing that you might notice is that these blue dots when we just look to the older terrains, they're relatively widespread. There are a few patches um, like Arabia Terra where it's relatively dusty and we don't have a lot of detections of anything. But other than that, where there are mineral detections, there are usually phyllosilicates or clay minerals of some sort. 
Now, if we instead look at some of the, the salts, so that is when water um, uh, precipitates or evaporates uh, to form different minerals like chlorides, uh, sulfates, carbonates, so they're there, they're present, you can see that they don't often co-occur. You get zones that are dominated more by carbonate, other vast areas, chlorides, are more common, although there's some areas that chlorides are just simply absent. And there are definite clusters for where we see sulfates orbitally. This is also a hot topic in Mars that is not fully understood. I, I have some of my, I'm working on this, I have some of my students working on this, but what is the control on the diversity? Because it's a, it, it, it's a control on the geochemistry of the waters, and why are there waters of different geochemistries spread out in different locations on Mars? And did they vary with time? Did they vary with space, or both? So let's take a look at what some of these environments look like. Let's start with these uh, chloride salts. So interestingly, um, they appear largely restricted to the southern hemisphere. Even when there's ancient terrains to the north, uh, they are not there. Uh, they tend to occur in topographic lows, local topographic lows, not the lowest points on Mars, which would be the northern lowlands and the basin that some have proposed held an ocean. But that's not where we see the chlorides. We instead see them in these, these local topographic lows. So, uh, sometimes they occur associated with clay minerals, sometimes not, although the relationship does not seem to be a formational relationship. Rather that older terrains with clay minerals have chloride materials filling in the uh, its surfaces. So what, what picture should we have in our head? Well, this is a picture I taken a uh, racetrack playa in, uh, in Death Valley. This is a very chloride rich deposit in a local topographic low. This is what we think the chlorides are. They're a series of evaporate deposits, that is ancient, ancient lakes, bodies of water, fed mostly by groundwater actually, that have dried up, just as in, for example, the American Southwest. So that's kind of one end member system, these ephemeral playa lakes. Now, in the same, relatively, as near as we're able to tell time on Mars, in a very similar time period on Mars, we see a completely different kind of, of lake system. That is, large-scale river systems that feed into deltas at lakes, much um, analogous to some of our largest lakes on Earth, like the Great Lakes. So Jezero Crater is about the size of, uh, of one of our Great Lakes, I think it's somewhere in between Erie and, and Michigan, if I remember correctly, but I would have to double check. Um, so it's fed by an, immense, by an immense watershed. There are two different rivers uh, that feed into Jezero Crater, one from the north, the north watershed, and one from the west. And both of them leave uh, delta deposits behind. And what's interesting is that these um, flow through terrains that have already been aqueously altered. And we'll talk about these background, ter older terrains in a moment. But they bring clays and carbonates uh, into the Jezero system. So this is the western delta, which I think is one of the most spectacular features, uh, water-related features on Mars. Everywhere that you, this is a false color chrism image, and everywhere that you see green, there's clay minerals uh, within within this uh, this this spectacular bird's foot delta. So the channel cuts through the crater rim here, and then the delta deposit stems out here. Now this delta has been eroded backward. That's why the scarp is so steep, and then covered by uh, a deposit that's probably a, a lava. When we take a look, uh, so the context for this image over to the side is right here. So it's an impact crater that's punched through the delta. You can see all of the char sed characteristic sedimentary flow features that you would find in rivers, rivers on Earth. That is, for example, these trough cross beddings from different channels feeding into the delta. So that's another sort of end member environment. So we have playas, we have large scale river delta systems that were long lived enough to, to, to fill up um, the, the crater that held it with one kilometer of sediment. And we are exploring now another one of these uh, potential indicators of a, of a river system, sh whether short or long, uh, right now at Gale Crater. So uh, this is Gale Crater, and you've seen a lot of its view from the surface of Mars with the Curiosity rover. This is stepping back to look at the regional scale of what's going on at Gale Crater, where the Curiosity rover landed. So Gale is actually, um, it's on the dichotomy boundary, which is that large topographic boundary um, between Mars's highlands and lowlands. And so Gale impacted that dichotomy boundary, and it's at the end of a whole series of drainage from these highlands to the south, 
toward the north. And each of these are a channel system heading that direction. So Gale and its um, fellow crater over here, Sharp Crater, have um, abundant phyllosilicates or clay minerals associated with the sediments in them, as well as the materials in their walls. And I'll refer you to the paper for more detail, but we can take a look um, now and relate what we see in Gale Crater to, uh, to some of those deposits. So Gale uh, was, is, of course, actively now being explored by the Curiosity rover. And some of its very first data pointed to evidence for lakes uh, within the crater. So you've all likely seen some of these pictures before. So this was one of the, the first, um, this was the first rock drill target for the rover. And it was selected because it was a very fine-grained rock that our uh, sedimentary geologist colleagues suspected was a mudstone or a siltstone, that is very fine-grained materials deposited in a lake. Uh, you see, though, that that's not the only thing going on. There are also these veins and nodules from later groundwater precipitation of minerals uh, within those sediments. So all of the Curiosity payload was brought to bear. Um, ChemCam data were taken of the drill hole, showing evidence that these white veins were, in fact, calcium sulfates of, of various kinds, some of them hydrated on Mars, very similar to what we see precipitating just beneath the surface of like um, uh, uh, groundwater systems and evaporative environments on, on Earth. <clears throat> also, the Kemin XRD instrument led by Dave Blake and the team here at Ames Research Center made the first uh, in situ discovery of clay minerals uh, on Mars from mineralogy uh, from XRD directly. And, uh, over 22% of the rock and 18%, so about 20% of this rock uh, is clay minerals, and the thought um, is that they've formed in situ. So this was a key discovery. Indicators of neutral to alkaline waters circulating um, through these uh, lacustrine mudstones. And since then, the rover has gone on. The lake story has only become stronger as we've continued to find rocks, in this case, an exposure in a, in a sort of a, I, I call it a cliff. It looks like a cliff, but then you see the scale bar, and it's so small. But nonetheless, it's a very key half meter of rock where you see um, in this a small cliff face the various laminae of successive episodes of mudstone deposited uh, in, in the crater. So the, the thought is that Gale, this is of course the artist's impression in the corner, we don't know exactly how full Gale Crater Lake ever was, but the idea is something like this, that you had water filling the crater and that as that lake level fluctuated, depending on exactly what the water level was, you would build out deposits. So if you were to start at the bottom of this graph, bottom would be early time. You might have had a uh, slightly larger lake. You were building out into it. As the lake level deepened, the whole facies here needs to steepen to keep up. And so we have a whole characteristic series of deposits, some of which are on the delta, some of which are on the mudstones in the lake bottom. And this is the sedimentary structure that the rover is traversing through right now. And we're in some of the oldest, deepest materials now, and we're starting to find new and different kinds of minerals. So stay tuned to the, to the news. Uh, the rover team is, is, is uh, piecing out some of those discoveries, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But how does this fit in our timeline of water? Because we can, we can presumably learn some of the fine details about how um, continuous versus episodic that liquid water was on ancient Mars if we very carefully study the stratigraphic record at Gale Crater. Like, did that lake last continuously for long periods of time? Or did, did it exist perhaps seasonally and then dry out? Or perhaps decadally and then dry out. You can think of different kinds of lakes, right? Some are persistent and long-lived. Others, like some of those that we have here in the southwestern US, if you, if you um, head out away from the man-made reservoirs, they don't, uh, they're not always there. They're there and then they're not. So which situation are we in at Gale Crater? Um, this is a, a, a mashup of, of papers, one from the Elman and Booz paper I showed earlier on the, on the right, and then more recently work from Marissa Lucis and JGR that tries to piece together the story. Early in time, we see this sort of large scale drainage that I showed out into the dichotomy boundary and the formation of a Gale Lake during one of the, la the later episodes when some of these channels were reactivated 
to breach that and form a sedimentary deposit and then a lake deposit in Gale Crater. And, and that may very well be the deposit that we're looking at with the rover. This appears to have then happened episodically at multiple times in history. And my box is showing up as a solid box instead of a, OK. Anyway, if, uh, if it were a clear box, <laughs> there would be um, several, uh, it, similar to the locations of these boxes, episodes uh, and dates for some of these intragale fans for when they were last active. And from crater counting, which is always tough with small fans, but it looks like they were last active in the, into the Amazonian. So that is, there was this large scale drainage early, formation of a, of a gale lake, but then these smaller kind of smaller sequences of lakes and then these um, last gasps of fans that may or may not have actually hosted a longer lived lake. And so I would encourage those of you interested in this story to take a look at the Palouses paper. <laughs> OK, so timing. If we step back and look holistically across all of Mars, as my colleague Caleb Fassett has done, dating the activity of some of these large-scale valley networks, um, the vast majority of them are, as I said, around 3.5 is a very key, key time. We, can't, we don't have the ability to date when they were first active. But by using crater counting, we can date when the surface became stable, when it stopped being active. And it looks like a lot of these were very, very much last uh, active right around this late Nuwakian, early Hesperian boundary, approximately 3.7 to 3.3, depending whose cratering chronology you use. And this was a time of very diverse water chemistry. So I've talked to you about our clay carbonate deltaic systems. Um, I've talked with you about the probably playa lakes where we form chloride salts. I don't have time to dwell on this, but there are others that have salts that are very clearly acidic. One of the best examples of this is from the Opportunity rover, where you may recall, of course, the discovery of these nodules, these blueberries, uh, on the surface of Mars. Um, also in these same sediments, though, are about uh, 10 to 15 weight percent jarosite in certain cases, which uh, jarosite is a mineral that only forms in pH of 4. So it means that at times, the waters flowing through these sediments were very, very uh, acidic indeed. We see evidence for this elsewhere on Mars of upwelling um, and then acidified groundwaters, such as in a whole series of craters, including Columbus, um, an unnamed crater. So unnamed craters that have interesting mineral deposits are always good to study, anyone who's interested in a project. And then more recently studied uh, Cross, Cross Crater, where these deposits of aluminum clay minerals and um, another acid sulfate mineral, allunite, have been found along with, along with jarosite. So this was a very interesting period in terms of, 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 uh, of rivers, of lakes fed by groundwater, of lakes sometimes fed by surface water, and then of perhaps if, if uh, the Palucis model of Gale Crater is right, of waning aqueous activity um, through time. So that was approximately middle Mars. Let's go still earlier. We're not quite at the very end here of the water story. We're stepping backward in time. <clears throat> so let's go back to these clay minerals. So I mentioned, just sort of in an offhanded way, that a lot of times these are older materials that are overlain by salts or cross-cut by valley networks. So what do these look like? Well, some of them are very thick sequences, up to five or 600 meters of quasi-layered, sometimes massive, sometimes brecciated. There are a whole variety of textures for what the lowermost layers look like. But they almost always have iron magnesium phyllosilicates of some sort in them. That is, these clay minerals, these hydrated layered silicates that have OH and H2O in their structure, indicating they formed in the long duration in the presence of water. Sometimes at the top, there is a layer that may be forming, or have formed rather, through um, intensive leaching uh, by groundwaters because the magnesium has been removed out of the system as have the alkalis and there's enriched in aluminum. It's a, stratigraphy, it's a stratigraphy we see in multiple places on Mars. I don't want to dwell on this, but the, um, the capping rock in gray, wherever you see it here, is like right at that late Nuwakian, early Hesperian transition I was telling you about where the valley networks um, shut off. And it's below that that we see these, these clay minerals. In the, at the top of the stratigraphy, the aluminum phyllosilicates, and then iron magnesium bearing materials beneath. And you can see that at Gale Crater, we're actually in the middle of those materials now that are right at that shutoff um, transition point. 
OK, let's go deep. Let's look at the earliest and deepest layers. So the clay minerals are characteristic of this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're most often associated with Mars's oldest terrains. This is the Noachian, which is in brown, and all the red dots are hydrated silicates, and you can see there's a clear association here. Um, interestingly, so the same, that the red, the red um, shaded sort of areas are the locations of hydrated minerals. The uh, color bar that you see here, in this case, is calculated drainage density from valley networks. And here you can see there's actually not a one-to-one. -one. You might think there should be a one-to-one -one because there was water in the valley networks, right? Well, but maybe that's not the same water that formed uh, these clays. These clays are, I think, older and I think from a different set of processes. So let's look at a few of them. So in the Nili Fossae region of Mars, and actually we're not going to go here first. We are going to go right here first. There are some a set of fractures that nicely expose uh, about 600 meters of stratigraphic section, so we get a window on what some of the oldest and deepest layers are. And beneath a capping volcanic rock that's enriched in pyroxene, there's this 500 or 600 meter thick sequence of these uh, iron magnesium phyllosilicate bearing materials. Now, the morphology of this varies greatly. It's not an organized layered structure like you might expect from sediments being deposited over time. Rather, it's massive to brecciated, and some of the brecciated blocks are probably from the late heavy bombardment period where some of the oldest basins were forming and have these clay minerals. I'm getting the five minute warning here, so I'm going to speed quickly through some of the textures. Um, here you can see some of those breccia blocks and get a sense for their, for their relative scale. You can also see these, um, these vein structures uh, flowing through the deposit. In this case, we're seeing a sequence of clay minerals overlain by olivine and carbonate rocks, which if we zoom in and look at the textures, they're fractured on a polygonal uh, level, and I think are analogous to some of the carbonate deposits that we're seeing associated with hydrothermal and then um, serpentinization and then spring systems on Earth. This is an example uh, from Oman, where you see also carbonates associated with highly igneous enriched rocks. Uh, in the interest of time, I will skip past this and say they occur in multiple locations. And then I will finally say, I want to end with a story from the craters. So the vast majority of the, the clay minerals are found in impact craters. Um, there are a few of those stratigraphic sections. They're special places because the vast majority is already jumbled by impact. When we looked at the impacted rocks that are spread out over the surface, they have numerous hydro types of hydrated silicates and phyllosilicates. Um, they occur, this is just a snapshot of a small uh, portion of Mars that has about two dozen detections. They literally occur in thousands of locations now that have been identified using CRISM data across the Mars surface. Um, we think that in most cases, what we're looking at is impact craters tapping a system, this is Iceland, the picture taken by me, of um, basaltic lava flows that have had igneous dikes intruded and that have been altered by aqueous alteration to have hydrated silicates uh, in the materials filling the vesicles of the rock, it would look something like that. And if we were to locate these in a pressure temperature diagram, they would live somewhere in the low-grade uh, low hydrothermal uh, type, type area. And this is the mineralogy of uh, hundreds to, to potentially thousands of, of locations on Mars has these types of characteristic mineral assemblages that either formed in hydrothermal conditions from kind of low-grade heating and metamorphism, or another possibility that's been proposed is directly from the last stage fluids of lava cooling. Okay, so hopefully the upper diagram makes a little more sense now. So in the modern epoch, these sort of episodic, very ephemeral um, evidence of potential near surface waters, certainly we know from the rovers at Meridiani and from some of these silica centers, evidence for groundwater and diagenesis and outflow channels too, right at the Hesperian Amazonian boundary. But the longer lived water with the valley networks was sort of restricted to this time period here, which was also the period where we think the vast majority of the clay minerals formed in the, sur in the subsurface. We don't know how far back in time this period goes. After about mm, the early Noachian here, I should put some gray shaded materials here because what we have exposed at the surface 
is only a fraction of the actual rock record exposed in some of those, those large stratigraphies that I showed you. So to conclude, I think the conclusions from looking at the data so far from our orbiters and landers are that early Mars was definitely warmer and wetter, no doubt about that. But the question is, is, is what did that environment look like? I, I, I tend to think that Mars was always somewhere in the cold and wet versus in the cold and dry regime, and that there was liquid water at the surface. Clearly, there are all these features related to it, but that it was somewhat punctuated and episodic, perhaps like a colder version of our own American Southwest. What's remarkable, though, is that this record exists. Those of you in the audience who are biologists and, or read astro and are aficionados of astrobiology know that Earth's earliest life uh, evidence for that is around 3.5 billion years. Everything I spent the last 20 minutes talking about, this really water-rich period on, on Mars is earlier. So we have access to that record in a way that we just simply don't have on Earth to explore what the early history of a terrestrial planet looks like during a period of intense volcanism and heavy bombardment. So looking to the future, uh, there is hopefully uh, NASA headquarters approval permitting the uh, MEPAG Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group has recommended and on NASA's behest studied um, the payload potential for a 2022-2024 orbiter. We think that the most important question is where is the water now? <laughs> Let's fly over in the early morning and see if those RSLs actually have water associated with them. Let's look at them with our spectroscopic instruments and see if that's the case. Let's probe the subsurface with radar and see how close to the surface ground ice is. And the 2020 uh, rover mission will be going to collect samples. And I think the key questions are, what processes controlled this immense and very early environmental diversity on Mars? And why did the environments change? We need to land. I mean, we can do so much from orbit and yet so little. Um, the key is that you don't know the difference between whether you're looking at clay cements, uh, clay sediments, hydrothermal systems, until you actually get on the ground and look at it like a real geologist. So that's what we need. Uh, our last rovers and landers have all explored these periods in Mars history. We have not uh, yet explored this one. So uh, I hope into the unknown in the future, into the earliest, most habitable environments, and I'll take any questions. So if you have questions, wait for the um, uh, mic to come to you so that we can capture your brilliant questions on the recorded version. And I do know that some of you have to leave because you have other time constraints, so feel free to do that, but also feel free to stick around for questions. No questions. Everyone understands Mars completely. Right? Everyone? Yeah. No questions. Yeah, go for it. Hi, fascinating talk. Um, what can you tell us about potential evidence for uh, possible ocean in the Borealis Basin. Yeah, you notice that an ocean, in spite of the fact that this was a water story, an ocean did not figure prominently. It wasn't there, was it? It wasn't there. But the question is, was it ever there? Um, yeah, so the, the short answer is that it looks like for all the world, like there should be an ocean, right? My, my, my title slide has these enormous channels debauching into the northern plains. And there probably was episodically an ocean because those waters had to go somewhere. I think the question is how long did such an ocean last and why has it been so hard to find any mineralogic evidence of it? Um, that is on Earth, if we were to impact craters into an ocean, we'd find large carbonate deposits. Maybe on Mars, if it were an acid ocean, we'd find sulfate deposits. Um, we don't see yet, I have a student who's actually looking, it's not obvious that there's anything different being excavated in the northern plains from what is in the southern highlands. And to me, that implies that in, on a cold Mars that any ocean must have been relatively short-lived in order not to li leave extensive mineralogic evidence. Now, what does relatively mean? It still could last thousands, tens of thousands of years. Um, but that's one line, the mineralogical line of evidence suggests that there wasn't an ocean there for very, very long. There's another line of evidence that's climatological, and I didn't have time to talk about this, but Robin Wordsworth published a great paper in JGR in uh, 2015 pointing out that if there had been for long periods of time an ocean at the top of Mars, it would have been the principal water source for any climate or hydrological system. 
and it would have greatly affected where we would expect to see precipitation and glaciers and then potentially ice melt. And he ran a few models showing that where we actually do see the valleys does not appear to be consistent with the primary source of water being in the north. But we'll see. Someone may yet post a response to this that answers the question. I have a question, actually. Um, I think it's really interesting your comment about um, groundwater being the primary source of fluid for the evaporite deposits. And when you look at those kinds of systems on modern Earth, they have a very fluffy and unusual and really characteristic texture. And I don't think so far we've seen those textures in the Martian environment. Do you think that's just because they're really old? Do you think that the groundwater is not providing the same kind of efflorescence processes that we see here? Uh, you know, what's, what's your sure, opinion I'll about a, that? I'll take a stab yeah, at that. I know, it's a hard so, question. well, if you were to walk out like onto the playas, and you should all do this, uh, <laughs> in like in California, numerous national parks, right, so as you're saying, the, the upper surface is very um, friable. It's very friable, right? Uh, it's easily windblown. It's, uh, it's, it's fluffy, and you walk on it, your footprints are... <clears throat> So I think, I think two things. I think, um, one, that a lot of what we're seeing are paleo deposits, and that when, once these are in the rock record, that they're being compressed yeah. <clears throat> and so no, no longer have that characteristic morphology for the older deposits. And then I think at the surface, as soon as the, the process stops being active, that you if you go to like some of these places where, um, for, what, for whatever reason, maybe the groundwater system has changed, that they're no longer as active, Wind erosion is highly effective in eroding away some of the, 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 the more friable, fluffier materials. And so I think that the most delicate parts of the structure have probably long since been blown away. Um, though I think if we landed and we looked in situ at some of these chloride playas, that's what we need to do to really understand at fine scale how they got there. More questions? Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm wondering how you think the magnetic field changed maybe or um, helped shape the geomorphology at that time? Yeah, so um, everything I have talked about is post-magnetic field decline. So uh, I don't believe I have this in my extra slides. But the, um, it's sort of, you can kind of tell it here. So there are two things that define when we think the magnetic field ended. One is the fact that materials that were sort of disrupted, melted, and recrystallized after the Hellas Basin and after Argyron Isidus don't have a magnetic signature. And so that, that's right here. That sets the beginning of the Noachian. That's kind of the definition of all the Mars surface units. The other thing is ALH84001 uh, is magnetized, so that sets it to be between 3.9 and 4.1, which is about where it plots here. So their air bars like basically overlap. But everything I've been talking about so far is actually a slightly younger surface. So it's, it's sort of a key point. And I, I would actually love to pick people's brains in the audience of how important a magnetic field is for planetary habitability. How important is a magnetic field for atmospheric escape? Because all of these water-related processes and environments that we're talking about, we think, if we understand anything about Mars dating, and even within our 200 million year air bars, I think we understand this, that, that everything I'm talking about was after the magnetic field. I think there was a question, yep. Yeah, I realize your talk is on geology and an organic chemistry, but I would like to pose the following question. Uh, can you rule out, based on the geology and organic um, type chemistry, any uh, uh, signs of related to life? I'm thinking on Earth, you might find fossils. You might find um, oil that would, was, there had to be ocean with algae. So not asking, can you find any sign of things, but can you rule out uh, things that were present? Uh, I think the answer is no, that we can't rule out, with, with the amount of data that we have now, as of this particular point in time, I, uh, I certainly am not ruling out life on past Mars. I think we possibly have not gone early enough to explore the best environments to find it. I, you know, we've sort of stopped, uh, like, here's our landers and rovers. A lot of what I was talking about was is here. It's even earlier in history. Um, and so the fact that we haven't found these kind of large scale deposits of life, like, um, you know, 
carbonate from life forms or uh, oil seeps or something like that or, or oil bearing deposits. I think that's too, too late in time for it to be the right analog. I think we need to look at what the fossils on Earth uh, looked like 3.5 billion years ago and then think about what they might have looked like even earlier, even though plate tectonics has destroyed most of our rocks from that time period. And they're very subtle, um, microscopic level, hard to find. And so I think it'll take um, some really detailed in situ work and return of samples from not just one, but multiple of the different types of environments from early Mars. We need to go in situ and look and uh, then perhaps bring some of these rocks back. Any last cracks at Beth? If not, let's thank our speaker and remind you that there is a reception. <laughs>